again, that funny feeling. Now my original plan for this video was gonna be to watch the special, take notes as I watch, and then just give you just give you a normal 10 minute long review about the, the ups and the downs and everything that goes along with, with reviewing something on Netflix or with reviewing a show or reviewing an album, you know? Like that, that was what I was expecting to give you. And normally what that would entail is I'll turn it on, I'll pause when I need to pause so I don't forget what I'm thinking, and then I write it down, and then I keep going. But from the very moment that I started this special, from the moment that I pushed play on this special, I was floored. I knew from the very first song that I heard, from the very first swell in music into the first chorus, I was like, ain't no way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ruin this first watch experience by taking notes because it, it just wasn't possible. It was it was too good. It, it took it took me aback. And at this point that I'm sitting down recording this video for y'all, I have seen this special six times. And really the only thing that I can think of after watching this six times, going on seven after I do this, the only thing that I can think of is Bo Burnham is a troubled genius. In, in, every, in every sense of the word, every time you hear somebody say troubled genius, it, he is a clear, definite case in the year 2021 for that and his craft. And ultimately, that is the reason why I titled the video what I did, because at the end of the day, Inside, Inside is the performance of a lifetime for Bo Burnham, and it is quite literally an unfortunate masterpiece. And like I said, I was going to give you just a straight up 10 minutes, these are my thoughts, rate it, and then move on with it, but there is no possible way. There is knowing knowing everything that I know about editing and being a and being a quote unquote content creator and everything that goes behind it. There's no way that I could do the disservice to Bo Burnham to just talk about the overall and not let your average person who doesn't know anything about editing, who doesn't know anything about the behind the scenes work that goes into that goes into creating something and putting your heart out there on it and like for people to rip apart potentially like that anxiety that goes behind that. And, and all of the work and all of the different nuances of the way that he per performed, directed, edited, everything about this. So I decided we're gonna not do it that way and we're gonna break this thing down and basically to three parts so that way you can understand not just my thought concept but also what I think about the way that he created this content, quote unquote. And the three parts that we're gonna break it down into are part one, my overall thoughts and everything at the very high level, part two, the musicianship itself, and then part three, the actual performance and recording and editing and everything that I, I personally experienced and, and, the, and the feelings that I had as I was watching this, someone who does this full time, someone who creates videos for y'all guys on the other end of y'all screen full time. And I got a lot to say about it because there is a lot of light that he shined on this without even, without even y'all realizing it. So let's begin. So let me start off part one by saying exactly what I said earlier, that Bo Burnham is legitimately a comedic genius. His ability to construct jokes is, is by far, is by far some of the best out of any any working comedian right now. And I would venture to say that it's even, I, I like put my name on it, that it's even better than most comedians right now because he has to do it within the confines and, and, the, and the constraints of, of songwriting. Like it's hard enough to construct a joke and it's hard enough to write a song on their own, but to be able to merge and meld those two together. And it's not like the song is lacking in any way. None of these songs, this, this is by far one of the only albums that I feel like I could actually listen to audio form alone. And that right there is something that is extremely unique to Bo Burnham. And it's also why that kind of brings me to point number two of the same, of the same sentiment is that only Bo Burnham could have done this special. This can only be successful for someone with the mind, with the mind that Bo Burnham has. Any other comedian, I don't, I don't personally think that they could pull this off because they feed off the energy of the crowd. You feed off the energy of the crowd knowing when punchlines are gonna come and you're laughing with everybody else. So the fact that he did all of this alone in a room and it still lands in the way that it does, like if he was there performing in front of three, four, seven thousand people, that's something that only he can do. And I feel like that's something only he can do because of because of the way that he came up in his comedic career. He literally started out as a YouTuber. 
So the fact that he started out as a YouTuber and, and had to do everything on his own and had to perform in a room for us on the other side of our screens from that young, like that automatically set him up for success and, and set him up for this ability to make this special because nobody else knows how to do that. And it also helps that Bo Burnham's like core audience are people like me, people who consume a lot of YouTube. We found him as we were growing. We were going through our adolescence together. He just turned 30 in the middle of the special. I just turned 30 in the middle of the I think we're maybe like seven months apart. So I've grown with him. And that means I started watching him on YouTube. So that means I'm already like prepped for this type of for this type of special. But even without all that, I think the main thing that makes this special as powerful as it is, is one, the songwriting ability, yes. But like I said, it's also the hyper awareness of where he fits inside of inside of content creation. The hyper awareness is really the only thing that allows him to land the jokes in the way that he does because it's kind of like self-deprecating without being self-deprecating. And that's really the reason why I titled the video in the way that I did. And yes, it's kind of clickbaity because it made me sound like I had a negative opinion of the special. But in all actuality, it is a very tragic, it's a very unfortunate situation that, that this is the masterpiece that it is. The worldwide pandemic, the hyper realization of, of where he fits in society and what his job is and on top of that obviously his his battles with mental health issues not just not just seen on this special but prior and everything that we knew about him that's only that's the only reason why this special exists and this special is by far a masterpiece so in order for this masterpiece to exist all these negative things had to happen back to back to back if the coronavirus pandemic never happened and everything that was expected of stand-up comedians to perform in the way that they do, like who knows if Bo would have even had this idea for this because he like the special is called inside because we had to stay inside. He dealt with severe anxiety when going and performing. And if that was the only if that was the only way that he could think to perform, we might not have ever seen any more Bo Burnham specials ever. So like I said, a masterpiece that had to have all these negative things fall in line in the way that it did in order for us to even be able to witness this. The genius of Bo Burnham's comedy and his songwriting capability is displayed right out of the gate with the very first song. It has this very, it has a very deadpan, it has a very, uh, I'm joking but I'm not at the same time delivery about it. Even down to like lines that say, sorry, I look like a mess. I had a haircut book, but it was rescheduled because Robert's a little depressed from being from having to be inside all of the time. Like that is something that instantly relates to people because we all went through that during the pandemic. And, and what makes it jokey and what makes it not is the fact that he like he says, daddy made you some content. So it's funny. It's like this comedic relief moment where it's like, yeah, it is funny that he made us some content. But at the same time, he's it's like it's also speaking to. It's speaking to his hyper awareness that like I could have made anything and y'all would have ate it up because all y'all, all y'all care, all y'all are addicted to is my content. For my core audience and just good human beings in general, my mental health might be at a, at a higher priority. So you understand why I stepped away. But for most of the internet, for most people, they don't give a fuck about that. So after that, we arrive at the second song. And when it comes to when it comes to the actual musicality side of the special, when it comes to the foundational like concepts of music uh, of like so a songwriting, this song is probably one of the standouts as being one of the masterpieces of the entire special. He starts the song at the piano, very slow, kind of like pondering, and then and then he uses the laugh track whenever he says what the fuck is going on, and like that kind of jolts us back to reality. That that yes, this is a joke, it's a funny moment, but then the use of the laugh track and the irony and everything that goes behind doing that in that moment live, it like, at least for me, it snapped me back to reality. Like the state of the world right now fucking sucks. And what made it hit for me is the fact that he's like, like he's jokingly saying like, I'm gonna save the world through comedy. He's making a joke out of it. Like it's not, it's not really saving lives or it's not anywhere near as important as people make it out to be. But in my opinion, that's what makes it hit because it is that important. At the end of the day, it really is that important. His job is important. He is saving the world literally with comedy and maybe not the entire world, but the world of one person, you know? And then we move through a couple different songs and then we land on the FaceTime song where I'm gonna FaceTime with my mom. Like obviously that's genius because that's the only way that we could, that we could communicate with people. And he's showing his frustration through 
through the song and through the lyrics and through the video itself, like clearly frustrated toward the end. And it might not even be that he's frustrated with his mom. I think it's more so just frustrated with the ability to, maybe not the ability, actually, the inability to communicate with someone face to face physically. So he might be taking the frustration out on her, on his mom and she's a boomer and she covered, you know, holds the phone real close to her face. And like, that's what makes it funny and that's what makes it relatable. But at the end of the day, we are all frustrated and, and, and it shows. And if something that you feel like connected with, humans need that human connection and touch. So, and you can't get that digitally. Now, one of the harder songs to listen to in the entire special because of how dark it is, is the one where he's, where he has Sako out. And he wrote the song clearly to sound like a like a kid song, like something on Blue's Clues or something on Dora Explorer, like that type of song. And then Sako comes out with the heavy handed, with the very realistic like picture of the way that the world works. Blood alone moves the wheels of history. And then his 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 conversation and his interaction with Sako toward the end and the fact that he's like smiling and laughing as a white guy while Sako's giving all of these all of these deep dark like facts he's laughing because he knows it's true that Sako's speeding up speaking all these facts but at the same time he goes to silence Sako and teaches him a lesson right then and there and basically shames him and asserts his dominance and asserts his power over him as a prototypical white guy nonetheless and then ending the song with that's how the world works that that shit is tough for me to get through, bro. And then we go right from that to the goddamn brand brand awareness specialist. That, that people don't even realize that this is actually the way it works. They're so they're so blinded by their by their agenda that they don't even think about the fact that these brands are using social movements for more brand awareness. Like you, do you honestly think? Do you honestly think that these brands care about you all of a sudden, or do they do they feel the pressure from people to have to care about something? And that's why he says, like, yeah, sure, J.P. Morgan is against racism in theory, you know, like like I'm just gonna say what I have to say in order to satisfy these people, and then these people are gonna promote my brand just for just for them thinking that I actually care about the things that they care about. And then the joke is actually the special comes out literally during prior month you know like it's crazy just the whole meta nature like he's pointing out a fact that people just let go over their heads like that at the end of the day these these companies are all for profit and most don't honestly care about you know social issues and sure that's a negative way to look at the world but at the same time the world is a cold and negative place it just fits and if you if you're if you're unaware or you think the opposite chances are it's because of how passionate you are about the social awareness topic that when a brand jumps on you don't even think to think that they're doing it for their own agenda you know and then that got me on to the next section which made me laugh because of what I do on YouTube bro where he does the he he makes the funny intern song again talking about a social like gray area where un, a, interns are unpaid and all that they get is some they get like work credit and experience which is which is needed on resumes from companies so the companies require work experience which in turn puts the pressure on graduates to become unpaid interns and then it all just falls into this vicious cycle you know just the fact that he reacted to the reaction to the reaction i was like yo I still don't even know how that that was shot. The camera on the first reaction didn't ever cut. We just got the re the next reactions in. I don't know if he did it in reverse order. I've been like trying to study it, but I don't know how. And then obviously, sexting is hilarious just because it's such a it's it's something that happens all the time obviously, with especially during quarantine, but it's something that's so weird when you think about it. There's so much shit that can get lost in translation and then the fact that he's like like he takes a picture and the only fl only thing you have is his flash. Like for me, at least in my personal opinion, it is so hard for the male body to look like anything nice. Elaine says it in Seinfeld that the male body is so utilitarian. Like it's just blah. It's just, even if you're in shape, like it's dick pics are weird. The male physique is all lumpy and it's like, you know, it's not it's not anything anywhere near as aesthetically pleasing as a female body, which is soft and curves. And I could just be saying this as a as a dude, but I feel like a lot of females would agree like there's you know, there's only so much that a dude can do in order for his body to look semi attractive in a photo, especially one you're taking of yourself. 
Meanwhile, the females are over here with like the fucking red light challenge on TikTok or whatever the fuck that was called. And all they're doing is showing their silhouette. That's all that was needed. So there is that anxiety for dudes about sending text messages and dick pics to girls. And then there there is that weird like lost in translation of emojis. And it's just it's just all a whole ass weird thing. Yo, sexy was funny. And and it's, it's I think it's at this point in the special where I'm like, damn. These are some fucking bangers, you know, like these tracks. And then we move on to the awkwardness and kind of like the ugh, cringe nature of the content appreciation. Like, hey guys, I just wanted to come out here and tell you that I appreciate you appreciating my content with like with the knife. And it's kind of, yo, know, it's so cringe and it's so off-putting. Ugh, ugh, makes me feel ugly. Yeah, I could even turn this shit green. Where's it at? Like, just like he had. Like, hey guys, thanks for watching my content. And I want to tell y'all more content where that came from. You know, like, hate that shit. But it's also like you got to be, like, you got to thank the people who are intaking your content so that way they feel some sort of, ah, he recognizes us. You know, that he knows that he'd be shit without us. So it's just such a weird, such a weird transition. And then I think the transition between, like, like where he's playing the song on the, on the ground on his own and he's doing his own takes, like it's just him with all this equipment. And then we go from that very complicated setup to him, like, watching either an Envy or like, if I could go back and tell this person the way, like if I could tell my former self that it's all gonna be downhill mental health wise, like he's kind of looking at it in envy and resentment for that younger version of himself when it was just him in a room. Like it was just him in a room with a piano and a shitty and a shitty mic and a shitty like camera. So those two scenes back to back, not to mention the color change from like a very yellow and warm tone to the coldness of the projector. And it's just, it's just like, it's a very surreal and a very eerie moment in the entire thing. The fact that he started out in a room as a kid and here he is at 30 years old in a room. And then next we have Problematic, which is a funny track on its own. So is the video, obviously very like 80s heavy with the with the sound of the electro, uh, the like the electronic drums, the doo 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 doo. And then the different editing techniques and the and the sweating like in the gym, all very 80s based. But you know what he's saying is is like it's true. Like how long before I get canceled from 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 doing the things that I did that I thought that were just very tongue in cheek when I was when I was a kid. And then the tone of the song is actually like, why has nobody canceled me? yet kind of he wants that to happen because the anxiety of not being canceled knowing everything is there to be canceled for that's got to be like anxiety inducing on top of the fact he already has anxiety disorder you know and then the transition I, I think that I think that every time he's talking in the like he's just talking to the camera or talking to us I think that that's like the closing of one chapter and opening up a new one in the special like in order so I think there are acts to the special but the one in the middle where he's talking about turning 30 is such like a melancholic moment. And it's something that I feel like every perfectionist feels. And you can clearly tell that Bo Burnham is a perfectionist. So being a perfectionist, having anxiety disorder, and then also setting timelines for yourself like that is that's just a that's a perfect storm of your mental health de like deteriorating. But that speech, yo, where he's it's crazy, it, it hit me because I just turned 30. And then obviously that leads us right into the song Turning 30 or I'm Turning 30. That's what I'm calling him. I don't even know what the song titles are, but it's it's such a real it's such a reality check when you turn 30 or you feel like it's a reality check. I mean, you're young. Young is all relative, I guess. Somebody could die at 31. Somebody could live to their 105 but you're still young but you're not you're not in your youth you are now a full-fledged adult you, you you can't make the same mistakes that people were making that you were making when you were 23 24 just because society says that 30 years old you are now a man you need to be handling your shit at this point. And just the existential crisis that comes from that. Like, I remember feeling this pressure too. When I was 27, I was building a birdhouse with my mom while my grandpa was fighting in Vietnam. Like, I haven't fulfilled any of my life goals. I am nowhere near a man in comparison to people who were 30 way back in the day or even compared to some of my friends who are now turning 30. They're having, my stupid friends are having stupid children now. Like, and, and the fact that he words it like that, it's very, it's almost like a very immature portion of the song, which is, which again, doubles down on the fact that he has this anxiety that he's not where he needs to be in life at the age of 30. So the fact that he dumbs down the song, just like that entire section, my stupid friends are having stupid children, stupid, like repeating it. It's a very immature section of the song that's talking about 
not being at the level of maturity that you should be at when you're 30. It's genius, yo. And then that pulls us out into like the streaming session, which now I'm quote unquote a streamer. Now that I'm affiliate, I have almost 5,000 people watching on Twitch or not watching, 5,000 people following on Twitch. By the way, if you're not following, shameless plug in the middle of this video essay or whatever the hell you want to call it, check out the Twitch. But anyway, it's hilarious the way that he plays this character of a Twitch streamer, bro. Literally using this mic, the Sure SM7B, the gold, the gold standard for for professional quote unquote streamers. And then the way that he like acted out something that looks like an indie developer game with the way that the with the way the character moves, and then the sound effects like it's very all robotic because. That's the way that indie games look. All the way down to the fact that he called the production studio of the game SSRI Production, bro. That's gonna go over the heads of a lot of people, but SSRI is like antidepressant. It's like anti-anxiety medication. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. That's what it stands for. And then obviously we have the very short song where I feel like a bag of shit. If you haven't done that before when you're feeling like shit, like literally saying, like singing out feeling like shit or moaning it out loud, like, oh, I feel like shit. Ugh. I've done that on multiple occasions and this is that, but at a way more creative level, songwriting level. And then after that song, yo, that brings us to the doozy of a song and probably the other masterpiece. The, this was the one that I was thinking of when I was talking about the second song on the, on the special. It's the second song of the special about comedy saving lives and is this one. Welcome to the internet, bro. This right here is, an, is a complete masterclass in comedy, in dark comedy, dark humor, in like self-realization and hyper-awareness of the world and what's happening on the internet. And just the, just the way that it's written, chef's kiss, bro. This song is perfect, literally perfect in my eyes. The way that the song is, is, is structured and the way that he's singing it sounds like a freak circus. Like that's the first thing that I thought of when I, when I, when I listened to the song. The first thing I thought of was a freak circus and then that scene in, in Across the Universe whenever they go into, they literally go into that weird psychedelic circus. Like that's the first thing that immediately came to my mind was that scene from Across the Universe. But the way that song just progresses, bro, and what it's talking about, like it's kind of like gaslighting you like, yo, what, what don't you like about it? You would be the first person that doesn't like the content that we have here on the internet internet because the content is what you're here for and then he starts listing off all of the weird shit that you can find on the internet within a google search and then as he's going through it it you it starts speeding up the tempo of the music so like you enter in and it's already very eerie and kind of like what is this place with the way that the, the notes sound and then everything speeds up so you kind of feel this sense of panic and then after that he drops you off and everything starts to fall down in this slow ballad and it's like it, it's it, what he's talking about is like the, the internet was never designed for this it was most definitely not designed to be this it was designed around you it's only this because of the users the users demanded a different kind of internet the internet is just like this wild west of random content and then that's when the song goes back into like the very scary tempo of the welcome to the internet beginning and that made me feel like when i heard it for the first time like i have no i have no escape from this so now that you know what the internet was supposed to be what it was designed for like now you've sunk too far and welcome you are now in our world you're now in our world because we created a world and you demanded that we turn into what we turned into so welcome you can never escape now like it's such a good fucking song, yo. God damn, that song is amazing. And then the next song that plays right off of the Jeffrey Bezos song from before, the whole special just feels like, and I don't know if this is just me, my feeling, but the whole special feels like we are watching, we are watching Bo's sanity just slowly fall through the entire, through the entire special. The feeling that I got immediately, especially with, especially with some of these shots, which I will talk about on the next section, if you're still watching at that point, it feels like we were watching Jack Nicholas's fall from sanity in The Shining. And The Shining was a very similar story in the sense that they were locked up in this huge mansion for, for six months, I forgot how long it's for, but they're there and they get cabin fever and we watch him slowly fall from his sanity in The Shining in the same way that we're watching Bo Burnham and his mental health deteriorate and fall from sanity throughout the entire special. And then next up we go into that funny feeling, which is like, it's not, 
it's not a comedic song at all. It's a song that holds a lot of irony, which is kind of like his song Irony that he performed like a couple specials ago, if I'm not mistaken. It was I think it was on his first special ever, if I'm not mistaken, on YouTube. But anyway, the song is structured very similar where we're talking about, you know, mass shootings at the mall. But you can buy, you know, something at the gun range, like a shop at the gun range. Like it's just that level of irony. But what makes this such a somber track is and what makes it really the genius that it is is a track. First off, the melody and the guitar playing, which he rarely does, and the fact that he has the lighting look like a campfire, it, that, that just brings it to the next level for me. Because campfire songs and sitting around the campfire playing and this very, this very slow, very, you know, peaceful melody, you're in a state of peace. You're one with the earth whenever you're like singing by the campfire. It's very, it's very ritualistic and primal and instinctive. So the fact that he's taking this very comforting style of music and putting this very uncomforting lyrics on it and saying, there it is again, that funny feeling. That statement alone has irony in it in the fact that this is a, co a comedy special. So he's saying, there it is again, that funny feeling like something's not right. And it's honestly one of my favorite melodies in the entire, in the entire performance. There it is again, that funny feeling. Like it's so good, bro. And it's such a good change of pace, especially coming off of like the uh, the stand up nature, like he's talking to an audience where he's talking about the outside world now seems unnatural and the interior digital space that we've created seems the most natural now. And then after that, we go right into probably one of the most emotional moments of the entire thing. I feel like for most people, not just people who deal with, you know, mental issues, like we are literally watching him bottom out. We're watching his mental state bottom out at the very bottom it gives me like a sense of panic almost watching him go through this not because you know it's almost like we know that at this level that he has now gotten to people commit suicide we've seen one too many tortured geniuses go to suicide you know and he could have easily fit in that with how low it looked like he got at least that's the feeling that i got and i always say this on any video where i mention suicide if you're someone who is experiencing suicidal thoughts there is a united states suicidal thoughts hotline that i will leave in the description but yeah that scene where we're just watching his mental state nosedive like you got to remember that we have this to comfort us millions of people are going to have this this special to comfort them especially if they're going through something mentally but he didn't have anyone he was all alone in this room and it's easy to forget that and the special for me kind of had two endings the first ending where where he's like where it's all blue and he's saying get out of your foot like put your hands in the air get the fuck up out of your seat like that song was just as powerful an ending to me visually and what he's saying as as the ending to be ha to make happy i remember being emotionally moved and jarred by the end of make happy that and that's the that's the same euphoria and the same euphoric experience and and melancholic experience at the same time that i got out of the second to last track and then the last track as well and i don't even think it's the actual last track itself i think it's the fact that he like stepped outside and had this jim carrey in the truman show experience he stepped outside closed the door behind him and he realizes that he's not in the real world he's trapped in in entertainment in being a performer and what he thought he wanted to do was go outside all he actually wanted to do was escape and go back inside but he couldn't very 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 truman show but at a much darker level this 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 the songs alone in this special they're perfect they're 10 for 10 the way the entire thing is curated from first song to last song 10 for 10 like i said this is a unfortunate masterpiece but what i'm mostly excited to talk about and the reason why i feel like it is the masterpiece that it is yeah the songs are great and the jokes are funny and it's all it's everything we come to expect from bo burnham but it is most definitely it's going to be the use of lighting the directing style and the editing so that brings us to section number three and that is going to be his entire production. So obviously when it comes to production, like it says at the very beginning after the first opening song, the opening song with the production and, and, and the lighting and using the disco ball and everything, it's a good it's a good reminder that he's doing this all by himself. So that entire trial and error scene, is that is what motivated me to make this third section of this video, lengthy video by the way, that, that because you are seeing him trial and error with the like testing lights out, bringing them down, bringing them up, looking at different scenes, looking, you know, testing the new lights that he got, testing the sound equipment. That's something that I do all the time. I have to check this mic on my own. I have to turn on my light on my own. I have to make sure that the framing is right. I have to make sure that all the stuff is recording properly, that I'm screen recording. Like these are all things that 
most people don't think about. They don't think about the level of production and the level of hard work in the background just to even get something that is presentable to you. The 10% that you see is the tip of the iceberg. Everything else that's in shadow, that's, that's all things that most people are not gonna be hyper aware of, but I'm glad that he put that in there because it's a testament to people who, who are their own production team. So now that I place that thought in your head, think about all the different scenes where the camera's in a different position, or think about all the different scenes where everything is on the floor laid out, and then the next scene, the entire room is clean. All of that, that's all him by himself doing it. Like, yeah, it's dope that he shot, edited, did the entire thing on his own, but think about everything that happened when the camera was off. Next time you watch this special, think about everything that happened when the camera wasn't rolling and all the things he did before, before hitting that record button. Now, the next thing and one of the most important things that I wanna talk about in breaking down the production is his masterclass of using light. A lot of people, like I said, I have this light setup that I do because I know how light has to work because I'm coming from a photography background. Like I know that having that ceiling fan light on is gonna be super unflattering. It's gonna give me bad shadows. You know, you're seeing something by Bo at this masterclass level of lighting that you might not even be aware of what's going on and why certain things are being made. So let's go through some examples of him being a master, a master at manipulating light to get to get the tone and get the get the feeling across. So the first very first scene that we see of Bo coming out here, like like with the light all on the one side, it casts a very moody, it's a very moody light style. For people who are fans of The Weeknd out there, if you look at the cover of Trilogy or you watch the music video to Gone, this lighting style should be familiar to you because it lights up one side of the face and then the other side falls off in total darkness. And it's a very dramatic lighting setup, especially considering that the song is very, it has a very light-hearted bounce to it. And then we pull to him using the headlamp going on into the disco ball and the disco ball like is spinning and providing movement to the scene without there actually being movement. And it makes us feel like a sense of, a sense of happiness, and especially after he says, daddy's made you some content. That's what I'm talking about as a masterclass. It's providing movement and providing energy to the frame, to the scene without the camera moving. And then the next song talking about comedy saving the world and healing the world, like the lighting changes from there. We got the spotlight, which reminds us that he's performing because it, it looks like a performer in a spotlight, even though there's not any crowd, like that directional lighting, that very harsh light that's being put on him. And then we get the overexposure of like God opening up. And then we have the warm light of the, uh, of, of like the heavens as they're giving him direction and confidence. Like, yo, from a white guy like you, the world needs you right now. And then we go from that into the high key lighting, which is, which is a very bright style of lighting, which is when he's like, when he's all energetic and he's happy to be the white guy that's saving the world. It looks like the lighting of a gap ad. That's what it looks like as he's talking about being the prototypical white guy who shot Stops that gap. And then in the same song, again, this is why the song hits so hard for me because of the different levels that it takes you. But then we go back into the main room and he hasn't even left the room, by the way. This is all the same room, but it looks like different scenes. But we go back into the very dramatic one light from the from the headlamp and it's giving him dramatic lighting on his face. It makes him feel isolated, but not as cold because it's warm light versus the cold light of the spotlight. Like he potentially does have some, some kind of impact. So it's warm lighting. You know what I'm saying? Like just just that song alone, the lighting, the, la the lighting decisions are crazy. And then in FaceTime with my mom, where he's using blue lighting to, to signify the fact that this is like, you know, it's not the it's not the happy conversation it should be, you know, but at the same time, he likes to seem blue because of the blue light that everybody talks about from your devices. And we're having to communicate through the devices. So not only not only are we sad that we're not seeing that we're not seeing our people that we that we normally can see face to face. Blue is like a it's a it's a color choice that would be on the cooler side of the palette, which is also something that like signifies like sadness, blue moon. We also have the light from the phone, which is just shining straight up. And that's something that he did on that movie that he, the one about middle, middle school, I forget what it's called, that very natural glow of the phone light, you know? And then clearly in the song with Sako, it's supposed to be a very like kid friendly song. Like it comes from a kid's show and, and it actually has like these very, it's very dark undertones to it. The lighting is clearly meant to look 
like a kid's show. Like the orange red fading into orange yellow in the background and the spotlight on him, even down to the big microphone right here, it's looked like he's performing for a kid's show, like Blue's Clues or something like that. So those lighting choices to make you feel warm and then the songs to make to make it feel like it's very lighthearted, like we're talking to kids, we're oversimplifying these very complex topics. And then you actually hear the lyrics and it's extremely dark, the, juxtap the juxtaposition between the lighting and the song and what the lyrics say, that wouldn't be anywhere near as successful of a joke landed or for the vibe of the song to get through if we didn't use the style of lighting that he did. And then again, we move into like the brand consultant on the inside where he's talking about brand awareness created by social justice, created by brand awareness. It's done in the style of like a documentary where you have a camera on the left, camera dead center, camera on the right and camera close up where he's talking and they're cutting and they're doing J and L cuts, which I'll get to when we talk about editing, but the high key lighting with the dark backdrop, like that's something that you see all the time in interviews of documentaries. The lighting itself is a parody of the satire that he's talking about, it's crazy. But then we go into the lighting of the of the reaction scene and the lighting of the reaction scene looks very similar to I don't even know what the reaction. Oh, they actually changed their name. It used to be FBE, but the, the lighting style is now react. That's like literally what the brand is, but it's just it's just react on YouTube. But it's just the lighting of not just that. It's the lighting of any like professional full on production of a reaction video, like the lighting of the breakdown on GQ, the lighting of the break, like the reacting on Vanity Fair, the lighting and inside reacts like like all of that all of those lighting it looks exactly like it does here and then we have the perfectly even lighting from the light box it looks exactly like a reaction and that's that's something that is done intentionally and then in sexting we have instead instead of having like different colors lights in the background he's in the dark because clearly most people sext whenever it's at night so obviously he should be in the dark as well and the only thing lighting him is his phone and on top of that he he has the he has the projector project, projecting different things like that's in his mind on him like with the different emojis and all of that but the whole thing just reminds me of it reminds me of the scene in Greece where where Sandy dumps Danny at the at the drive-in theater and you have the drive-in like projecting different things in the background and the song even so, kind of has that same tone again a different stylistic lighting choice that he made to have that on his face because literally these emojis which which symbolize sexual things that's the only thing on his mind so it's literally covering his entire face and then the fact that he's projecting like the convert the text message conversation on the wall and he's dead center it makes it feel like the replies from the girl and and the replies from him are so far apart and he's dead and his emotions and everything he's talking about is dead center but it makes you feel like it's far apart because we're social distance like we're doing this intimate thing at a very non-intimate distance and it, and it drives that point home even further and then in that little like intermission cut scene where he's talking like talking with the knife and like pointing it at again more lighting and camera angle decisions he angled the camera a little bit lower because a lot of times people like to have lower cameras on YouTube so it looks like he's talking down into the camera and then he has the LED light on just like in the same way that I have mine on and then he either has like a ring light or a very big softbox so it just provides all of this light on his face it's just, again, driving home the point that people are going to understand this joke if they watch a lot of YouTube. And then the next transition scene where he's sitting on the ground playing the piano, the lighting is very natural. There is no artificial lighting. This is just what's coming from his windows. And it reminds us that even though he has this grand, this grand performance that he's putting on, he's still just in a room by himself. But then right after that, the lighting flips once again, and now it's all blue and it's very dark. And the only light that's on his face is the light from the projection of him watching his younger self, either in anger or in envy or or whatever the emotion that he's feeling in. The, the lighting is cold because it's a blue light from a di digital device. And on top of that, it's providing a lot of contrast on his face, which makes it look a little more menacing. And then we move on to the next song, which is problematic, and it has very it has very structured lighting. The light is coming from behind him to provide shadow and silhouette and then he has like the he has the one strip of light and then obviously the crucifix at the very end where he's like crucifying himself for the for the decisions that he made as a kid but the warm lighting and the entire motion and everything about it it feels very 80s and it feels very workout ish like if you watch any music video that has any kind of workout montage this is exactly what it looks like and again it's warm lighting this time because he's hot he's sweating the song is fast-paced you know if it wasn't a warm light if he went with a little bit of more of a 
a white light, like the light that's shining on me, it wouldn't have the same level of energy. It wouldn't have the same level of heat. So then we move on to the next scene where it's just him sitting there with the with the clock and the light is not even on him. He is not the center of the, the center of attention in this scene. The spotlight is on the clock because that's where his attention is going to. So he's forcing our attention onto the clock and, and, and the dialogue he's providing in the background in the dark. The only light that's on him is kind of the light that's bouncing back at him. His dialogue in the dark about how he feels like not necessarily a failure, but he failed at reaching his goal of finish this thing by 30. And he has just the spotlight on the clock as it hits 12. Again, another lighting choice that's emphasizing the mood. Then a couple songs later, after the intermission, after the transition, after I Don't Wanna Know, which also has a very distinct warm lighting style, like the fact that the fact that he doesn't wanna know, he's keeping himself in the dark about whether or not we're actually intaking the content in the way that he intended. Like, are we too distracted to actually give him our attention for an hour and a half? Like, like he's saying it out loud, but he's like, I'd rather not know and that's providing him a sense of comfort and that that's why the lighting is warm. It's a comforting light on him. But the next crazy use of lighting is the one where he's talking about feeling like shit because the song is like very upbeat and it's very happy, but he's talking about feeling like shit, like he's down. But the the song, the lighting, the energy of the lighting, the movement of the lighting, the way that it the way that it's like turns on, turns off, background lighting, he's in silhouette. Like there's all kinds of energy in it, but the song is about feeling drained and feeling like shit so now he's not using the lighting to bring home the mood and the of, of the of the sentiment of the song he's using it for the juxtaposition he's using it here because it doesn't match the lyrics of what he's talking about and it's kind of like one of those like you know when shit is just going so bad you have to laugh that's what that song sounds like and that's what that lighting feels like 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 it's just a comical it, it's just a it's just it's comedic relief for a very dark moment you know and then again just like i said the master class in the very in the second song the first full song and then the lighting that goes behind it and the song structure and how it all matches again we arrive at welcome to the internet and its song structure and how its lighting matches as well like we start out with the blue light first off which which feels very inorganic because most light that we get from natural lighting sources is yellow at least in terms of like the sun and then on top of that we get the spinning lights that like the green laser dots that are all spinning it feels very it feels very hypnotic the lighting the spinning the fact that like the song is speeding up and then when we get into the song where we're talking about what the internet was intended for and it was this very innocent place at the at the start of it so the spinning green lights stop and the green blue contrast stops and now we get now we get more complementary colors with the red and the with the red and the blue and it looks like ocean water behind us a little more peaceful, a little more serene. And then he literally turns it off and then laughs his way back into the track about the darkness of what the internet now is and how we can consume everything all the time and how that's not a good thing for us to have. He turns the light back on and then he turns on the then he turns on the waves like the wave light as well. So now we're getting everything, all the emotions, whenever we need it, whenever we want it, all right there. Don't forget, this entire production was him alone. And then we get to the climactic, get your fucking hands up, get up out of your seat, you know, that song, and, it, and it's blue again, which is, I mean, that, that, that stylistic choice could just be because we're seeing him at the very lowest level. The happy feeling isn't what we thought it was gonna be from the special, because it's a very dark level of humor in the special, and then the, it's really not even the lighting in this scene. It's more the camera movement, so obviously. There's a lot of thought and a lot of intention and a lot of emotion that goes into the way certain scenes are lit. But what also plays a factor is the camera angles that in the way that they're positioned and the way that everything's edited together. The main thing that you're going to notice of this special is the very slow and deliberate push ins and pull outs of like, again, the camera's not moving. He's probably shooting this in 4K and then pushing in on a 4K image and then uploading in 1080p. So that way you don't get any loss in quality. But the slow, deliberate push ins and the pullbacks are what's providing even more emotion. And I think it was those slow, deliberate push ins. I think it's on the one, specifically the scene where he's watching himself on the projector, like the younger Bo from YouTube, and we're pushing into him. I think that's the scene where I realized where, like, this is reminding me of The Shining because there's very similar moments with very similar, like, tones underneath, literally, like, audio tones in The Shining where we're pushing in on Jack as he's losing sanity, as he's, like, looking down at the maze, as he's looking 
at his kids, at his wife, you know? And that's what gives me like that horror feeling like we're watching him lose his mind. And again, just the push in on the first song when he's singing and then and then the camera cuts and he's in the and he's in the right third of the frame as he's saying, what do I do? And it's in a close up so we can see the emotion in his face. We're connecting with him for the very first actual song. And again, I think he only had one camera for the whole thing, because if you look at the beginning of this song, when it's the wide shot, like you don't see the camera from the from the close up, like there's not already a camera that's set up. I think he set the one camera up, performed up into the point where he knows that he's gonna cut, then moves the camera and then performs the next section again. And there's no camera on the floor again in that wide. So when he turns and looks at, I'm a special kind of white guy, and he's looking down at the camera at an upward angle, again, I think that he stopped, turned, turned it back on, and then filmed again at a different angle and then just stitched these things together at such a like professional level, you wouldn't even realize. You wouldn't even realize that there's not a camera there unless you know to look for it. And then again, the push in when he's writing and the and it's just the and it's just the desk lamp on him and and he's and we're pushing in as we're getting more we're getting more intimate with him. And then the pullback as soon as he cuts away to the laser show, the pullback and the lower level of the camera makes it feel like he's grander than he actually is. So that way he like it's a sense of like. I'm healing the world with comedy. I'm a superhero. Like we get that feeling from that pullback and, and, and for the fact that it's lower, like it's we get more space. So we're like, damn, he's bigger, larger than life. And on the editing side for some of these songs, specifically the the white woman's Instagram and, and you know, having conversations with my mom via FaceTime, the fact that the, the black bars come from the side, the letter boxes, and then and then they give you like uh, the same aspect ratio as your phone when you're FaceTiming. And then also the same aspect ratio of, or of, of Instagram's originals format, which was a square. Like it just brings you further into the world. The fact that we don't have the white screen if we had the widescreen for that facetime track it wouldn't have hit anywhere near as big or the impact wouldn't have been anywhere near as large same thing for the instagram track because we look like we're looking at instagram posts whenever they're in square format it's perfect but i truly think that the best even even knowing the first the first real track of the of the special did or not real but the first full length track of this of the special did it very well I still think that because the, or not because the internet, that's Childish Gambino. I still think that Welcome to the Internet has the best use of editing in the entire thing. So first off, we start out with this wide shot when we start the song, and then the shot gets narrower and narrower and closer and closer. Again, just making that feeling of that we're being drawn in, we're being drawn in, we're being hypnotized, but it's an uncomfortable feeling because it's happening so slowly. The push in, you don't even notice until it's too late and you're and he and you're on him. And then as the song speeds up, when he when he like looks behind camera and then looks down and then looks up and does all of those different takes, again, those cameras aren't in the wide shot. So he must have performed the song four or five, six, seven times and then stitched the different camera angles from those takes together to make it look like one long performance. So we have the push ins and then we have the hectic editing like back and forth, back and forth whenever he's talking about all the different options that you have on the Internet. And then we have the pullback whenever whenever he gets to talking about the lighter side of the Internet, what it was intended to be. And you start to feel a sense of relief because we're pulling back. And then as soon as he starts, you know, with this with the sinister laugh and talking about the, the Internet and how it's this freak show, we start pushing in one more time like. It's a perfect example of editing. It's a perfect example of the the editing and the and the push ins and the way everything is pieced together, making the energy of the track. And then, like I said, the second to last track where he's talking about get out of your seat. I think this is the first time in the entire special where the camera movement is actually optical. Like he takes it off of the tri he takes it off of the tripod and we're moving it. Like we're in a sense of euphoria, but also in a sense of like kind of panic and we're getting a little nauseous to the to the camera movement and the overlaying of him on the camera and then the projection of him from the camera. And this is the first time that the camera has moved that's not been a push in or a pullback because everything else has been stationary and then pushing in or pulling back digitally in software versus the camera actually moving and changing aspects, you know? And because it's the first time, it's almost like we're catching ourselves in this feeling of euphoria because it's the first time that we're moving like this in the entire hour and a half. All of this was done on his own. The bits, the songwriting, the directorial style, the editing pace, Everything, the lighting, everything about it was him on his own. And I feel like it's easy to forget that because of the fact of how professional and clean it looks. 
I feel like that's part of the reason why he has these wides of him singing and he has these intermissions where you see all the mess in the room to ground you in the fact that this is all him. And that's why that song where he's saying, I don't want to know is so it's so peaceful for him, but melancholic for us because they might not be paying attention to his masterpiece. Quite literally already my favorite stand up special of all time. In my opinion, this is over every iconic stand-up special that you can think of. Eddie Murphy in the all red suit. And you know, Richard Pryor, Kings of Comedy. This is doing something at a completely different level. I don't even know how else to explain it other than that this is a 100% masterpiece. And this masterpiece only exists because of Bo Burnham's mind. There is no other comedian, no other comedian that could pull this off. Even if Kevin Hart did some type of like something like this where he had a quarantine special, you and I would know that there is an entire million dollar production team behind him. Like the level of intimacy would not be there. Yes, the jokes would be funny because Kevin Hart is a master storyteller, master joke writer, but it would not be this personal. It would not be this intimate. It would not be this jarring. It would not be this emotional. Because Bo Burnham started on the internet, because his entire career started by doing the same thing at a very low production level, like, like a diamond in the rough type thing, he's going back to his roots, but now as a 30 year old adult who has the technical capability to pull this off, he has the knowledge, the knowledge of editing, the knowledge of screenwriting, the knowledge of lighting, the, the knowledge of so song making, the knowledge of song production. Because of all of that, along with the quarantine, along with his mental health, along with the way that he is hyper aware of the way that the world and internet works, he is quite literally the only person who could have ever given us this masterpiece. And if it wasn't for those series of unfortunate events, we might not have even ever gotten this. But yo, after a long time recording, I've been recording for three hours almost. We are now at the end of the video. If you made it this far, please let me know in the comments that you made it this far. I expect zero people to make it this far, but if you did, I would greatly appreciate knowing, knowing that you, knowing that you took in my content and we got more content where that came from. You know what I'm saying? But yo, like the video, please consider subscribing. I want to do a lot more of this in-depth type of breakdown thing. So if, if you if you let me know that this is something that you like, the videos will be way shorter, but I had a lot to say on this one, but we will make more of these videos. That brings us to the very end. And like I always say, no matter the video, go out there in the world, love and care for one another, love and care for each other. I'll catch everybody on the next video. Peace.